everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here at Virtual Art Tech House as we have a conversation with Rafiq Anadol, an artist whose work we've had the honor to showcase at all three of our locations. My name is Lena Galparina. I'm the Visitor Experience Director here at Art Tech House, and it's my honor to lead this discussion uh, with Rafiq Anadol, who's a pioneer in data visualization as well as collaborating with artificial intelligence. Uh, his retrospective exhibition, Infinite Space, started in Washington, D.C. and went on to be showcased in Miami. And his work, Machine Hallucinations, was the installation that opened our New York location. So Rafiq, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's an honor to have you with us remotely, but still being able to talk. Thank you very much. Uh, great to be connected again in a virtual world. Happy to share and excited to like share more, actually, with Art Tech House. Wonderful. Um, so just to get started, you know, a very broad question, but uh, what got you interested in art in the first place? So I think the, my general understanding of the power and the magic of imagination start for me like while I, was, while I was eight years old. I watched the movie Blade Runner and that was a profound understanding of what will happen if I have a chance to like analyze the world around me. And what will happen if I start to imagine a world on top of the world I am inside? And the same year, I got my first computer. And that was my, like, I think, took off from my physically biased world to a world of imagination. And since then, I think I'm constantly thinking about uh, a kind of a narrative that doesn't belong to our reality, but it somehow finds a way to become a piece of art, a piece of experience. And that's, I think, how I started that, that journey. Wonderful. And it sounds like um, your this journey to explore the possibilities and build on what is around you, um, you kind of naturally fell into using technology, but what attracted you to using this tool in your creative process? It was definitely like those days when I found out that the science fiction itself as a, as a thinking school of thought, let's say, was also, also like as a kind of a starting point for me. And the act of like remembering the future was a super strong uh, statement in my own mind and in my own reality. But what I found much exciting is when I shared these narratives and these experiences with more people, the more actually I found it much more connections between the ideas and the humanity. And that was kind of like why I found out that actually the, my personal problems or my personal interest is not just techno fetish world of technology and its amplification, but I'm much more inspired by what will happen if a narrative and experience connect with other people, what, what happens and how it interacts with the idea itself with a human. And that specific moment was my inspiration. And technology is allowing us to do this much better than uh, using a traditional tool such as pigment or a brush or a canvas or a bronze or like a material that belongs to let's say 19th century or 20th century so my inspiration was always like finding out like what exactly this early 21st century uh, artists have been exploring going beyond these physical tools uh, and it's clearly led me to the, le the level that this technology which we every day using even now we are using to communicate is the new network that i am much inspired than i think physical world um, and, you know, as you've, you've been working for more than a decade in this uh, sphere and since 2015, you've had um, your own studio in Los Angeles where you've been creating these works and uh, to this day. But, you know, at what point did your relation, how did your relationship with Arctic House come about and, you know, the work that we've done together in sharing um, your creations? Yes. So I think um, personally, as I said, like, as you said, like a 10, almost 10 years now, I've been working with data and especially like last five years, um, I was able to open a studio in Los Angeles right after my MFA studies. And for me, the dream was like truly create a space where I can really be, like just imagine these ideas, but not in a, like a traditional art studio, but in a world where I can uh, be really connected with the people I, I found purposeful and impactful for my journey. Pretty much I'm inspired from the cinema as a medium because cinema is a medium that we know that requires a group of people that come together to like imagine something doesn't real but feels real. So that was my mental model. And then opened the studio five years ago. Now we are 12 people, uh, mostly from 
25 median age, can speak 12 language, like very diverse uh, group of minds. And then um, we start, you know, like we start like create those pieces that are mostly public art projects. They are permanent. Um, but also at the meantime, uh, almost now nine years, I've been creating immersive experiences uh, in, in the form of a physical room or immersive room with like multiple channels. And it has been going all over the world. But what was really unique with Arctic House project, first of all, the retrospective project was like, I was able to finally find a place that I can compile all the ideas in one location, one point of view that people can immerse themselves with similarities on the surface, but depth still available. So that was like one of the beautiful challenge. I mean, I'm almost like I'm 34 years old, but I, when you say retrospective, it's something mostly applied to the people in their uh, 80s or 70s, like, I mean, s some artists using this word specifically to compile their lifetime. So for me, what, which was very unique, I think, feeling for the Art Tech House project was almost like I was able to compile last five years as an art, uh, as a retrospective. But in last five years, um, we have really focused on the data itself as a pigment, the data itself as a sculpting these numbers in a purposeful, emotional way. So in Infinite Space Exhibition, we were able to compile the wind data paintings, uh, melting memories, which was focusing on the human memories. We were able to like even get some NASA GPL data sets. We were able to use our first AI, and I think the world's also first AI project truly really use AI in public space. We even compiled Bosphorus, which was another piece that visualizes the water surface activity. And then we also create a, a new piece from scratch called Machine Memoirs. So it was a very full, and plus Infinity Room, sorry, I forgot that, which is a very famous piece. So this whole thing is one location and one, you know, one location that you can feel all this is a beautiful challenge, I think, done meticulously in Artica's first DC, now in Miami. And, you know, this journey that you took with us to take all of your work and to create this exploration of, you know, infinite spaces, you know, what inspired you to want to bring your work together and also build on it? Because as you said, there was a few works that debuted at Arctic House in DC. Yes. So I think the first thing that I really enjoy so far that people really enjoy as well is the beauty inside data. So first of all, once we talk about data, it becomes something very abstract for people. Like, first of all, people are thinking like, what does this mean? Like what those numbers means? Of course, when we talk about data painting or data sculpture, what I'm trying to say is, it's not about taking data as it is and put it as raw as possible. It's about like taking data and create a dramatization, which we can say data, data dramatization, meaning imagine a wind in Boston, the feeling of wind power, the speed, the gust and direction taken into in the form of like some kind of a beautiful poetic motion. Like that specific moment in time is the experience. It's not like showing the numbers or like, no offense, but boring numbers that doesn't have any meaning versus when they become meaningful. So, so that's all about this translation. And as I think one of the reasons that I think I was uh, very lucky in this medium is I was one of the early pioneers who took this data and applied these algorithms. And it's the first time in Arctic House DC, especially, we were able to create infinite boxes, which were allowing people to step inside the idea, not just looking on a flat screen, which is, I think, a very innovation of like experiencing an artwork, right? Because normally we know that a painting means most likely two and a half dish piece of experience on a wall versus when if you talk about the data painting, I think it's beyond just a biased frozen pigment. The pigment here is in motion, a pigment that has its own kind of, you know, time and space concept. And in, in, the, in that infinite space concept, we thought that people should be able to feel the infinite amount of data that surround us. So you really become a part of the canvas was the idea. So we execute this and it was, I think, very fresh. 
I would have to agree. It was definitely empowering and uh, immersive to the full extent of that word to be able to spend time with those artworks. Uh, it's interesting how you speak of data, you know, as you said, you know, it may sound boring to somebody or how do you take something that's just so many numbers and translate it into something poetic and beautiful. But if you could speak more to this act of visualizing data and I believe you also sometimes rec uh, refer to it as data dramatization uh, which is a new way of uh, talking about this genre. Yeah. I think this this specifically um, again I'm coming from a public art perspective for me what I learned at least my speculation during my uh, first and second MFA studies I was always like thinking and sharing with many of my uh, mentors I was always criticizing the idea of a museum or gallery is so much biased way of exploring art. And I, was, and I had so many discussions, including one of my first collector, Bill Gates. The speculation was, I thought that the true art of a current time may not fit inside a museum or gallery because these entities are most likely responsible for storing centuries of information and keeping them, keeping them in a very climately perfect environment, secure environment, where you go and look something precious from past, but feels it's like alive today. I think that feeling was, for me, completely like annoying. And I'm only saying that annoying, meaning not the, not, I'm deeply appreciating everything that belongs to that world, but I'm annoyed by the bias of being able to know that you are going to see an artwork on a wall. Like, like that feeling was for me, was limited, at least what we are doing right now in 21st centuries, especially 2020. So to speculate that world, also to speculate the experience of art in the context of technology and the tools we are using, the data I also found that can be a purposeful pigment that is goes beyond the, the, the frozen idea. And so now in my practice, I am in like almost three different pets. The one pet really focuses on public data and public data meaning this can be a, a, a beautiful uh, permits from the city of X, permits of buildings, energy usage, like even like the amount of like lights on the street. This is one data set. Or it can be public data meaning social network activities. Like we know we are now using those, those especially nowadays more than ever, to communicate each other, to, 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 to left our memories and emotions and ideas behind us. That's another like a very important domain. I'm also working with environmental data sets such as the water and the wind and temperature. Um, I think almost now five years, I've been really obsessed with our nature as a whole inspiration. Uh, the water itself, I'm super inspired by the water. I think, first of all, we are all made of water as a human bodies. Without water, we are most likely nothing. And then water itself is, I think, have everyone's, I mean, I think somehow people are totally feeling connected with the water, not by watching a sea or a river. Inner, our inner body itself is a water itself. So we know that it's a fundamental material. And then also the third is I'm also working with like a mission intelligence, which is AI specifically letting machine to learn from a specific data sets. This can be an image archive, text archive, sound archive, let machine to learn from this and literally took my, I can take my brush and dip it into the minds of a machine and paint with what machine learned. So that's like my third kind of, um, world of imagination that that's trying to do. And while doing all this, uh, since my very first artwork, I guess like almost now 10 years ago, I always use architecture as a canvas. I always state that media arts and architecture should connect. And that connection, I think, where I found the purposeful and impactful narratives. And data narrative is basically, or dramatization is, exactly dramatization of when a media art and architecture connects and how and why and all these things but what that specific feeling is my dramatization studies let's say hope it's clear a little bit visually yes definitely it's uh I think it's when experiencing your work it can be seen how uh the elements of 
what you took, those data sets of, you know, the movement of the sea, and then to be able to stand in an installation that feels like the sea, I think it's a beautiful, uh, truly poetic way of converting something that is scientific and maybe overwhelming to the human mind um, and translating it into an experience that um, is, can be emotional or intuitive. So it's, it's a beautiful way to create art. Um, and I'd love to hear more, a bit more about why you're collaborating with artificial intelligence, why you brought in this component into your creative process and you know, what has been the most surprising thing that you've discovered in using this medium? Yes, so I think, first of all, I've been aware of AI pretty like my early ages. I know that it's a speculation. I know from the science fiction stories that this desire of a machine has a sentiment quality of thinking, deciding in these movies that we discuss have this capacity of becoming a part of real life as beings. So I always enjoy this idea of like speculating about like when a machine becomes sentiment, when a machine remembers or dreams or machine have this cognitive capacity like who we are. I think it's pretty much any, any science fiction I think lover uh, or, or has this similar I think imagination. But for me, what was really, I think the gift of my life kind of moment was when I truly get invited from Google Arts and Culture and Google's Arts and Mission Intelligence Group to, to become an arts in residence, to become the one of the first artists who truly use the tools that they invented in terms of an art practice. Like that was a really kind of this Renaissance moment, I think. Uh, we know that in Renaissance, the artists were getting the best pigment, the best brush, the beautiful empty canvases that they were depicting, right? I think exactly similar thing happening right now in the field of like these tech giants who have this enormous capacity of like, you know, uh, production or imagination or research. Also like having this new, I mean, the last couple of years, also have this desire to like go deeper in their research and understanding of these tools with arts. So I think I am one of those early artists who truly working with these entities to, to imagine future by using tools from future uh, before they become a product, I guess. Because when I talk about AI in that research project, we were like imagining tools that even not exist. Like we have been like creating things that are not even there yet. So this is a very beautiful feeling, I think. And I think arts has this quality of always imagination, like uh, always, like artists were always inspired by the technology around them, always like they try to use them in the maximum capacity of its, its imagination. So this is a very similar to happen to me as well. But the other wonderful thing that happened is once I started to learn that AI can truly become an incredible collaborator that allows you to like learn from whatever you show, like this means hundred millions of images of New York. It can be 10 million images of a library. It can be 50 million images of a landscapes or a moon or a Mars or a Saturn. Or, like it doesn't matter. It, it has this quality of learning in some capacity. So for me, what was inspiring is if a machine can learn, can it dream? Because I don't think learning itself is just enough from my perspective is to say machine learn, but like in our life, our experiences, our emotions, memories, makes who we are, right? Because we use processes learning into an experience or other cognitive skills. So I was inspired from specifically, what will happen if a machine truly can speculate a moment of dreaming, a moment of hallucinating? Um, and these are like very, of course, last now four years of experience, I'm still, openly saying, I'm not a computer scientist, but I'm personally enjoying learning to learn. And what I learned so far is machines has an incredible quality and capacity of collaborating. Once you have a purposeful questions uh, and, and once you have a purposeful reason. Um, so an AI in this context, allowing many people like me to use big data to create a creative output. Um, we, and simply, I'm calling it hallucination because, again, four years ago, while we were like discussing this with AI curators and engineers at Google and recently now in, at NVIDIA and in Intel and IBM, the very similar thing happens. Pretty much common consensus is when a human interprets the machine, it's not anymore a dream, like the humans have its own cognitive skills. It's more like an 
hallucination because and, and a human interprets what machine learned and how it exposed to the, like again back to the reality so that's why i'm calling them machine hallucinations or like that's like kind of a, again it's an ongoing research who knows where it goes where it comes but for me the keyword hallucination and it's responding experience with the machine's mind is one of the findings because it can create almost realistic but not real but almost realistic feelings of seeing uh, things in life incredible uh, something you as you were talking about this you mentioned how you know you were invited uh, by these companies that you know have maybe other primary purposes but they are involving the arts uh, you know at Arctic House we created these homes to be at the intersection of art, science, and technology. Uh, we believe that's where a lot of this innovation in the 21st century is headed, and that's how we're exploring as human beings. Um, as an artist at the center of this, um, why do you think, you know, a lot of people say, like, you know, if you put science here and art here, they're, you know, they're opposites, you know, they're not the same thing. One is creative, one is logical. Uh, but someone who's in the middle of this and, and living in both uh, all, of, all of these worlds, um, why do you think it's important for arts to be within this sphere of technology and science and all of these things that you're involved with? I think it's a very good, 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 good question, a problem. So I think, um, but if you look at the history of human imagination, if you look at like really centuries old, like experiments, it's always, but always, actually science and art and technology have collaborated. It was never actually truly separated. Um, and it was never actually discussed even separately. But I think what makes the current situation of humanity is more trying to group things individually than trying to group them together. I feel like it's one of the problem of sense of displacement, meaning the humanity feels or humans feels more uh, I think safer when things are individually analyzed and became connected. But actually, the reality is way complex than that, because this each individual m territory of, let's say, uh, imagination or productivity for humanity, they always symbiotically connected each other. For example, anyone I think like myself who enjoys being on the edge of imagination, who is really on the edge of what can be done with the current tools and the feelings and the reality, will never be happy with a one kind of a medium, will never be finding things that are easy and simple and just one like thing that can, because I think what we are as humanity going more richer understanding of who we are, why we are here, <laughs> like what will happen to next to us. And the more we get into these mindsets and, and being more sensitive, the more we connect many things. So simply anyone who is, I think now creating with any tools, like eventually using those like different mediums and specifically, I think art and technology, especially, like when we found the photography, it's a technology that we know that once the very first pigment invented, once the very first, I mean, printing invented, when the, once the very first computer um, like invented. I mean, these are all like individually the same amount of imagination always requires this collaboration. But, but I think people somehow, I think traditional thinking, uh, the people who are observing the world, let's say more convert, like more conventional, let's say, decided to separate these fields. But the more actually from the hands-on minds and souls who are using these, these imaginations, we're always connecting them. Uh, but I think like many things, like when we found the fire as humanity, we have a chance to cook with it, right? Create communities around it. With the same uh, technology, we create guns and separate each other. So it's a very similar problem, I guess, that is now a much important time to collide many disciplines to make much more purposeful inventions and experiences. So I feel certainly that the more, the more the fields are connected to each other, the more the profound things we are, I think, creating. 
Wow. Uh, and, you know, as you're working in this realm and you're creating uh, things that you're passionate about and that you're observing about humanity and about the world around us, um, what do you hope people take away from your artwork? So I think one, one thing that I'm really very hopeful is having an awareness of the tools we are using. Like in all these exhibitions, people can really go and each, each location, DC or um, now Miami, we have these like kind of a process videos, like it shows what's going on or the Arctic House uh, team like meticulously explains what people are seeing in that moment. So nothing is hidden, nothing is like kind of like more invisible because I think my process is making invisible more visible. And once you have a staff, once you have like people carefully like yourself and many others at Arctic House team goes and explains, hey, what you are seeing is coming from this data, represents this. I think it's a beautiful uh, statement about what they are seeing. Of course, some people say art doesn't need that. Art has, doesn't need an explanation. Art doesn't need to be understood, but has to be felt. I completely agree with those mindsets and I completely on the same page. But at the meantime, I also believe that the art also has to, right now with this important time of humanity, has to also have the capacity of inspiration, has the capacity of education, because eventually these pieces can inspire an upcoming generation. The piece can make an old moment in someone's life that can inspire that mind to go back and learn about computation, learn about, I mean, sound design or who knows. So that's, I think, very important as well. And I think one of the reasons I'm enjoying through these exhibitions, through Arctic House going alive is the purpose of pieces are not anymore just on a glass or on a boring screen or whatever. It's, it's going to the people's mind and soul. So being aware of this importance and how like we should be careful about these moments of imagination and connection, I think what makes these exhibitions unique is the capacity of touching mind and soul beyond just be being an artwork. And I think that makes this, our collaboration very unique with Art Tech House. Thank you for that. Uh, we do pride ourselves and everyone in our team really is passionate about helping people connect and uh, learn something, uh, take something away from their experience. Because for many people, it is the first time that they get to see art like this. And it's Absolutely. exciting to be the place where people can come check it out. Uh, you know, you're create you even since you've showcased um, the exhibitions at uh, in DC and now Miami you're continuing to create and you know now as I think everyone in this world has been impacted by the current state of uh, affairs um, how do you stay inspired uh, during times like this so first of all I'm extremely feeling uh, depressed in the beginning of this problem like because first of all it's a very unique feeling. If, as a person who have been like thinking about science fiction world, this statement is always speculated and always simulated in the movies, in the, in the books, in the, in the... So I feel for the first time, I'm a very optimist mind. I'm a very positive and hopeful mind, even though I'm aware of amplifications. I'm always like very also positive in the hopeless world of how we do these things with, with, with the world of technology. But it's the first time I feel like we are completely on the wrong path. It's the first time I felt that, oh, wow, something is really dangerously happening and we cannot stop this if we are doing things as we are who we are. So I feel the power of change, which is like being at home, disconnected or connected in different ways. But what was really weird that I was feeling, I am in a science fiction movie, but this thing is very real movie that is truly happening. Um, but also I'm a little bit more not hopeless because very openly saying I'm a person working with computation and people all around the world. So I was always ready for connecting with people in anywhere in the world. I think for people like me, we didn't get too much affected uh, because we were always in this mindset. The shift is, I think, psychological shift, like because now we had this awareness of like what to touch, like how to say hi or how to like get a, even like, I mean, it's just everything connected to each other is kind of has to disconnect first and connect again. And that feeling, I mean, if the technology isn't like this right now, what we have, we will be in a much more desperate situation. I think we should be thankful to technology that it allows us to 
not only just connect us, but also at least like we can keep going in our life, even though we are disconnected, but we are somehow connected. And I think from the beginning of humanity, this never was happening, right? The fire was connecting people. Now the fire is a giant network of humanity that can touch each other through this IP <laughs> and bits and bytes. So I think it's very inspiring days, also very sad at the same time. So I'm calling these moments dangerously beautiful. Um, so I don't know what will happen, but it hopefully it will become something hopefully positive. And we will learn better and fail again. We will fail again for sure, but hopefully we will fail better next time. Yeah, I, hope is, I think, what's bringing everyone together and kind of helping everyone do their part. Um, one of the things at Arctic House that we're participating in is a project called uh, Folding at Home, where yeah. our locations are closed, but we're lending a use of our computers to researchers who are working to combat this virus and, you know, hoping that the technology that we have um, enable through this network, as you're saying, and this connectivity, um, enables these researchers to get to an answer faster so that we can um, reach that beautiful and hopeful future. And we were wondering, you know, um, you with your studio, because you employ such advanced technology and supercomputers, um, are you participating in any such efforts? Yes. yes, exactly. I think it's one of the most important points. I think it's the first time in humanity we are fighting with something together by using technology we have. And I think it's a very incredible time of humanity that we can use AI, we can use quantum computing, we can use like pretty much any resource we have. Like we are seeing the tech giants are opening their hardware, softwares. Like it's an incredible like, I think, connection between different knowledge for humanity. And of course, as a studio, we are probably one of the most prominent uh, technology connected uh, minds. I'm personally connected with like many scholars and also connected with like many uh, academics that are currently researching with the, the COVID-19. I'm also personally connected with the people, one of the AI engineers who are allowing uh, Fold at Home or similar projects. Now we have multiple of them, uh, which is great. Um, especially since we are heavily using GPU in our studio for AI studies, we have some leftover power still, so which we are donating them. But also we are personally, and me and my team is researching to visualize this invisible thing. Um, so we have a research going on uh, and hopefully will be resourceful. And we are helping another group of academics that I cannot now um, disclose their name, but we are literally helping them to let their uh, researchers get some tools that allows them to visualize complex folding some other parameters so we have like a multiple layers one is public one is private like all like hopefully goes to the same purpose make this invisible visible uh, and i think other thing is very inspiring is if if we can on time uh get the more understanding of the i mean it's the first time humanity watching the curves it's the first time humanity is all together watching like these dangerous tables with spiking like lines to the upper right uh, it's the first time many people who doesn't know how to read data is reading data to just get a sense of what's going on. Um, and I think if humanity learns again from these charts, from such a simple acts of health, just rules, such a simple things. I, I think first of all, the world has changed completely, I believe. Like we are completely changed. After this, we are a different kind for sure. Um, but again, hope we don't fail again with this capacity. Hope we fail better is my hope, I guess, again. And I believe technology will enhance where we are for sure. Well, hearing you talk about this, I know it gives me a little bit more hope and uh, connection to you know, this experience. And you're absolutely right that we are all trying to understand, have some sort of sense of um, control or capacity to predict. but. Um, it really does show the importance of data and how knowing um, how this thing is moving and how it's changing, uh, how that can, that information can help us do something better with it, help us come up with a solution. Um, and it's incredible that you and your studio are, you know, already studying that data and um, seeing what creative expression can come of it. I mean, exactly. And, and I hope that, of course, we need a 
like a happy ending, right? We need something that really ends positive and um, somehow have a control of this moment in time and space and hopefully have a concrete result, right? Uh, like the previous uh, um, issues, not only just this specific virus situation, but things happen in different scale, right? We had wars, we had conflicts, we had many things that separate us. But it's the first time every single mind and soul in this planet, humans, are looking at one thing that is the same problem. It doesn't matter where you are coming from, who you are, your age. It's just something, a big lesson, I guess, for us. Um, so I don't believe in borders in, in life. I, I, I hate the edge of the screen and I never enjoy my own lim limit of imagination or my mind's capacity. But I do believe that this will open everyone's mind and soul, stretch everyone's, you know, imagination and hopefully emotions. And we create a strong memory for humanity as a whole beings, billions of minds together. So I hope we can learn deeper from this, that can the next generation as well can learn from this. And that memory, I think, is our responsibility um, and I believe we will do a good job, <laughs> hopefully. Very true. I, I do hope we'll do a good job with this responsibility. Um, but, you know, you, you've spoken about how the world's going to change and, you know, you're already a little bit said how even the current things that are happening are influencing your work. But, you know, um, what's in store, you know, in the future? You know, you have many projects that were already in mind that you're rethinking, but um, as an artist, you know, living through this time and being at the center of it, um, you know, what can we expect from you in, in the future? Yeah, so I think I have um, significantly um, focusing on, in my practice especially, um, two different fields. One is still public art. We have significant projects all around the world that are focusing on public arts, they are permanent pieces that open for any time for anyone in any background. And we have also now current research with uh, environmental data and, and currently working with United Nations directly. And we are exploring other problems of the earth. Like this is, yes, Corona is something we all now are aware of it. But we have also things like that already, maybe didn't have the same attention and the, and, and the powerful impact, but there are things such as like climate change is a one whole big topic. So we are working with uh, two different teams and visualizing that reality as well. Uh, so like, I, like we are between this private and non-profit world, I can say. Uh, and I'm also teaching constantly. Um, so I think sharing is everything. Um, otherwise what we are doing and why we are doing it will be a limited. So I hope I'm using this now window and this setup to, to, to teach um, and share my knowledge. So I think that's what's going on in the near future and excited for hopefully the world to come back to its little bit previous situation and get physically connected again. I believe we will appreciate physical world more in these unique days. So I have more physical projects coming, I think, after this. <laughs> uh, that's great to hear. And uh, truly, you know, we at Arctic House and all in the audience, I think, appreciate you uh, opening up your mind to us, um, sharing your practice, um, but also, you know, your perspective on how things are. And um, I think for me personally, at least, I know definitely I learned a thing or two, even though I've spoken with you many times before, every time we have a conversation, I learn something else and um, feeling a bit more hopeful. So thank mm -hmm. you so much for your always inspiring words and your um, brilliant and open mind. Thank you for taking the time to answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to connect with everyone soon, physical world. Yes, definitely soon. And we look forward to welcoming you back to our tech house. <laughs>